first lesson for higher biology. We are on unit three, key area three, crop protection. And in this lesson, we're going to be looking at the issues we have with using chemicals and the possible alternatives we can use instead of using chemicals. So you will be expected to understand the problems that may arise from using pesticides and what the alternative methods are. So you need to be able to give the impact of protecting crops with chemicals, explain how biological control works and any potential risks, and explain what is meant by integrated pest management. So we need to consider what would be important in when designing a plant protection chemical. So they really need to be specific to the pest concerned, so not toxic to other species. They need to have a short life, so not persisting in the environment, but broken down into harmless byproducts. They need to be safe for human users and animals, and ideally they should be variable, and that helps them avoid resistance by pest populations. One of the key issues we have with pesticides is that of biomagnification, and that's where the pesticide concentration increases at each trophic level of our food chain. So if we look here, we've got our crop plant, our tomato plant, and it's been sprayed with our pesticide. Our aphid comes along and eats the crop plant and consequently receives five molecules of insecticide. Ladybird comes along and eats 100 aphids, therefore winds up with 500 molecules of insecticide. Our blue tick comes along and eats 10 ladybirds and has 5,000 molecules of insecticide. And the peregrine falcon comes along, eats five blue ticks and winds up with 25,000 molecules of insecticide. And that's the process referred to as biomagnification. So our concentration of pesticide is increasing at each level of the food chain. And what might be considered a safe level if you were just eating the crop plant becomes a very unsafe level as we get higher up the food chain. Now this is not to be confused with something called bioaccumulation of pesticides. And bioaccumulation is where a pesticide accumulates in the body of one specific organism. So again, if we have our tomato plant here, if it's been sprayed with a pesticide, our aphids comes along and on day one it receives its five molecules of insecticide. On day two, it receives another five, so it's now got ten. On day three, it receives another five, so we now have fifteen. And on day four, it receives another five, so it now has twenty. And the same would apply to any ladybirds that would be coming along and eating several aphids. So we may get to day three or day four before the aphid would actually necessarily die off. And that's referred to as bioaccumulation the fact that that pesticide is going to increase in the body of our organism. So the fact that we have both bioaccumulation and biomagnification means that it's very important that those pesticides are able to break down within the body of our organism. We also have a particular issue with pesticide resistance. Looking at our top area here, if we have a population of pests the blue ones are the ones which will be affected by our pesticides and the red ones have a genetic mutation that just means they are naturally resistant to that pesticide. So applying the pesticide means that those ones are going to survive into the next generation. Consequently, our next generation, you can see on the left hand side, we've got a larger quantity. The ratio of red to blue has started to change. We've now got more red, more resistant pests. Using the same pesticide again means that these ones are likely to survive and continue to repopulate. Now, in order to avoid this, what you would try and do is use a different pesticide the second time. And that would hopefully get rid of any individual members of the population who are naturally resistant to the first pesticide. So the main problems and solutions with pesticides we have. So the problem are that they might be toxic to non-target species. So we need to make sure it's specific to the pest concerned. There's a problem that they're persistent in the environment. So we need to make sure they can be easily broken down in the environment. Bioaccumulation or build up of the chemical in an organism and biomagnification, the increase in concentration between trophic levels. Really to avoid those, we can apply them in the lowest possible concentrations. 
And we also have the problem of producing resistant populations of pests, and consequently we need to try and vary the type of pesticide used. Now, one of our alternative methods is that of biological control, and that's where we can control a pest population through introduction of one of its natural enemies. And these enemies could be in the form of a predator, a parasite, or a pathogen. So, a good example of a predator would be our ladybirds controlling an aphid population. So, ladybirds will naturally prey on aphids, and introducing ladybirds to an area would allow that control. A parasite, for example, there is something called Incarcia, which is a parasitic wasp, and it actually lays its eggs inside a white fly, and that destroys it. Finally, we have a pathogen, and this is the bacterium that we were talking about previously when we talked about um, genetic methods of being able to um, improve the resistance of our crops. So this particular bacterium can infect caterpillars with a toxin called Bt toxin and kill off the caterpillars. Now again, that's going to be quite specific to the caterpillars and shouldn't cause any harm to any other organisms. So consequently, these are three main methods of biological control. Now, there are some risks involved uh, with using biological control. Generally speaking, it's better carried out in closed systems, such as greenhouses, so that the control agent cannot escape into the wider environment. If that escape does happen, or if it occurs into an environment which doesn't have any natural predators of our biological control organism, or parasites, or diseases, then their numbers could increase rapidly and infect the local populations. So, common examples seen of that are the cane toad in Australia, when that was introduced to Australia in order to deal with some pests there. They've then had a consequent population explosion of cane toads as there are no natural predators or diseases or parasites that are going to affect these toads. Similarly, we have an issue with harlequin ladybirds. They are capable of transmitting disease to native ladybirds. Uh, they are also actually capable of eating the eggs of our native ladybirds and consequently they can cause issues in terms of our population numbers. Finally, we have something called Integrated Pest Management, or IPM, and that uses a combination of our chemical, biological and cultural methods in order to improve yield. Now, when you are looking at these areas of IPM, for example, you wouldn't necessarily be expected to know about all of them. We have talked about forecasting, um, we've talked about cultural, biological and chemical controls. Um, important to remember as well, natural plant resistance or genetically modifying crops and breeding crops is another potential method we've got of um, managing the pests that we have in our environment. So the main aim of IPM is to reduce chemical use and only use chemicals which do not persist and we may also be able to use chemicals to reduce pests to a level at which we could then allow a biological control method or a cultural control method to be used instead. So from that, you should be able to give the impacts of protecting crops with chemicals, that of bioaccumulation and biomagnification, and also potential root producing of resistant pest populations. That biological control is using a natural enemy of our pest, and that can come in the form of a predator, a pathogen or a parasite. And there are risks involved there where the biological control organism may escape and be released into the wider environment. And finally, the integrated pest management is really the combination of using chemical, biological, cultural methods of pest control. As ever, please get in touch if you have any questions. Feel free to leave a comment, visit the website or leave, send me an email on the address to follow.